So how does someone end up being a university professor and an experimental social psychologist? What path do you take to get there? How does a person decide to do that? What's it like being a university professor? What's it like doing psychological research? Well, this book, Not By Chance Alone, by Elliot Aronson, gives us an insider view of what it's like to be a university professor as well as what it's like to be an experimental social psychologist. Hi, I'm Chris Gibson, and I want to share this book review with you. Just a, a quick note about myself. I'm a former assistant professor of counseling psychology. Now, my focus was on the academic side of psychology with specific interests in social psychology and psychology of religion. I feel excited to share this with you because I've enjoyed this author, Elliot Aronson. He quickly came to prominence and recognition as one of the most influential social psychologists of the second half of the 20th century. Using his high impact th theatrical experimentation method, Aronson's research began to receive recognition even before he graduated with his PhD in 1959. Now his upbringing is kind of the first section here. And his upbringing, honestly, I initially skipped these chapters, chapters one through three. But as I was reading the rest of the book, chapters four through 10, I realized that there's a lot of formative information in the chapters one through three that I had skipped. So I did go back and read them after I had skipped them and I found them interesting. So, so I actually read them though after I covered quite a few of the other chapters about his education, professional life. But there's some lessons in Aronson's book, really throughout his book, he learned some key lessons in psychology and he learned some key lessons just in life. And so I wanna share those as I go and kind of build this somewhat around that. One of, one of the things that he learned is our early experiences often drive our future interest. And that's one of the reasons I had to go back and read those first three chapters that I'd skipped. Part of Aronson's draw to social psychology was really his experience, his life experience as a Jew in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. He, he felt a personal concern over prejudice because of where he was raised. Being Jewish, Irish Catholic neighborhood, uh, the prejudice that existed there, he experienced it firsthand. And so that made him want to study it more. And that's one of the areas that social psychology studies. Aronson learned another important lesson as well as he became a teenager. And this lesson was that we can recreate ourselves in new environments. We can recreate ourselves in new environments. As Aronson was growing up, he was a shy, backwards kid. And then as he became a teenager, close to it, he wanted to get a job on the boardwalk. Well, the job that really paid the best was a job that required somebody to be more outgoing and, and loud and get people's attention and get them into this uh, area where that game uh, could make money. And so Aronson, Aronson recreated himself so that he could do that job. And so he got a chance to fill in for that job. And when he filled in for it, the boss heard him and gave him that job. And he, he made good money doing that one. And so our early environment does not have to be a self-fulfilling prophecy for us. And this was a very important lesson for him to learn, especially not only as the job on the boardwalk, but also as he went to college. Now his education is just, I mean, it's really incredible to read about, especially if you know anything about general psychology or social psychology, because he had this he had multiple opportunities to work with these incredible mentors and and he did and several of the names you would know or will know uh, from general psychology or even from high school uh, so Aronson went to Brandeis University and going to Brandeis University he met this girl he was kind of interested in and he got to talking with her and he just followed her to class one day talking with her 
and it was a class taught by Abraham Maslow. You may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's the same Abraham Maslow. And so he went there, and, and Maslow showed an interest in Aronson, and so Aronson found both his major and his mentor, uh, even though he didn't get the girl. I mean, he found his major and his mentor, that was a lot. Uh, so an obvious lesson then is we need mentors in life. And I'll mention some other mentors that Aronson had as he, as he went through his education and even on into his professional life. Uh, an obvious lesson as well that he learned was that when something is taken away from you, you want it even more. Aronson went through his first year at Brandeis University and then his scholarship was not renewed for the second year of university. And without that, he couldn't pay for it. So he worked all summer and he, he managed to scrape together enough money to pay for his tuition but not room and board. So it ended up he was sleeping and eating whenever and wherever he could. People would slip him food in the cafeteria and he would eat it when no one was looking because he didn't want to get in trouble. He got caught sleeping on the floor of his brother's room and couldn't do that anymore. And uh, he, he talks about sleeping in cars and sleeping in various places because he, that's what he had to do to get through because without his education, he knew that it would be a major loss. And so he wanted his education so badly. Um, and he wanted it badly in part because it was something that was being taken away from him. And so when something is, is a threatened loss or is potentially going to be taken away from us, we tend to want it even more. His next mentor, he went on and applied to Wesleyan College for a master's degree in psychology. And so his next mentor was David McClelland. Now, Aronson, he had met another girl and courted her in his last year of college especially. And, he wanted, and they wanted to get married, but f before he would marry Vera, he really needed to settle some career direction. So he decided to go on and do his master's at Wesleyan University, and it was an interesting situation because McClellan needed a research assistant, and he really didn't have many people applying to his small master's program in psychology. Well. Aronson, actually it wasn't Aronson, it was Vera. She stumbled upon a flyer that had been posted. She ripped it down, ran to him, and uh, they got in contact with McClellan. He applied to the program, was accepted, and he ended up working with McClellan during the time of his master's degree. Now, this was formative as well because McClellan was a social psychologist and he was interested in achievement motivation. And once again, I mean, this is wonderful. You get to read about these mentors that Aronson had, and he gives us such a, a personal description of them. He tells us about his interactions with them. They're not just names in a textbook. They're real people, real living people. And that's what makes it so interesting in reading this book, that when it comes to Abraham Maslow, when it comes to David McClellan, they're real people, even though they did great academic research. Now, McClellan, he went on to Harvard University, and he actually invited Aronson to come as his graduate assistant and continue working for him at, at Harvard. But Aronson decided to go to Stanford University instead to do his PhD. Now, his most formative moment at Wesleyan University, it came when Mike Worthmeyer asked him to give an introductory lecture, an introductory lecture uh, in psychology. And so after his lecture, Aronson, apparently he just knocked the ball out of the park with the lecture. It was a great lecture. The students enjoyed it. He loved doing it. And after his lecture, he knew he wanted to do this for his profession. He wanted to teach college psychology. That one experience gave him a vision for his life and it pulled him toward his future. And so he goes on to Stanford University and at Stanford University, he meets the person who's probably his most influential mentor, which is Leon Festinger. Now here, Festinger, he had developed, he was just publishing his book on cognitive dissonance. 
And once again, here you get this personal look at Fessinger and who this person was. You see, Fessinger's idea is still uh, in social psychology textbooks. It still talks about them. It still talks about cognitive dissonance. And it's in introductory psychology textbooks as well because it's very influential. And so Aronson worked with Festinger and he learned from him. He developed his research methodology while he was working for him. And eventually Aronson would modify cognitive dissonance by adding the self-concept to it. But Aronson was already on his path to becoming an experimental social psychologist and a university professor. Aronson's mentors, or it's just a who's who in the history of psychology. Uh, when you look at these names, Maslow, McClellan, Festinger, and when you look at him, it's just incredible the mentors he had. It was amazing to read these first-hand accounts of these psychologists, and he really, he shows them as people, not just as names on a page with theories. Now, moving on to his career, Aronson was heavily involved in experimental psychological research. He, he interacted with other famous uh, social psychologists such as Gordon Alport, which is a huge name in the history of social psychology, and also the soon-to-be infamous Stanley Milgram, the obedience experiments. And Aronson went on to teach at Harvard, at the University of Minnesota, he taught at the University of Texas and finally at the University of California at Santa Cruz. While continuing his work as an experimental social psychologist, he also made this slight turn to humanistic psychology with T groups. He got personally involved in T groups. He got the training, his wife got the training, and it really was life changing for him as a person. And, and it was funny to me reading that because there's often a conflict between experimental psychology and humanistic psychology. In his professional life, he was one. In his personal life, he was another. And, and I found it very interesting the way that those, uh, those worked out in his own experience. Aronson had a long career. He influenced many areas of social psychology. And this book discusses it. And not only does it bring to life the various uh, psych psychological personalities, you know, Maslow and McClellan and Festinger, but it also does the same things with experiments and theories. Sometimes when I talk about those in class, when I used to talk about those in class, I mean, it could sound dry and why on earth would anybody even want to research this? And yet, so often they're sitting around the office, Aronson is with grad students, and they're kicking around ideas and somebody says, what about this? And it just takes on life and they say, hey, you've got to do an experiment. You've got to try this and see if it works and see what you find out, what you learn from it. And so often there's this background to the experiments that just makes it that much more interesting in reading the book. So it is a well-written, it's an interesting book. I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in an academic career, especially as a university professor, anyone who's interested in studying uh, experimental psychology would enjoy this book as well. If you have a bookstore that you frequent, please support your local bookstore. But if you happen to decide to purchase this book and you typically order your books online through Amazon, please consider using my affiliate link in the description box below. I'd appreciate it if you would consider that. If you'd like to know when new content is published on this channel, please consider clicking on the red subscribe button. I hope to regularly publish book reviews, especially on social psychology and on psychology in general as well. So I just want to say thank you for checking out this book review. And this is Chris Gibson and there's more to come.